There are moments in the past that become pivotal to our identity, for better or for worse. We remember our first time getting lost equally as well as we remember the first time watching one of our favorite movies. For me, two of those moments are getting lost on a beach and watching E.T. the extraterrestrial for the first time. Our memory of these moments are heavily influenced by the emotions we felt while they were happening. It's the age-old issue with eyewitness testimony. It's unreliable, and often thrown away in favor of more objective and compelling evidence. In court, this emotional incursion into memory can be a case's greatest weakness, but it's one of film's greatest strengths. Largely, that's why we see so many remakes or reimaginings of older IPs. The industry can never recreate the indescribable emotions within us when we recreate a film from memory. Studios play a dangerous game when they regurgitate old, beloved material, though. Nowadays, they risk alienating entire fan bases, extreme online criticism, and even death threats. We can endlessly blame the greedy execs in Hollywood for killing our most cherished childhood movie, but that ignores a flaw within ourselves. The truth is that, to a certain extent, the studios are responding to market influence, and we the fans desperately want to revisit those feelings and memories of old. In a way, we're just as selfish as the people making money off these endeavors. Who are we to exhume the long-dead memories that we cherish so dearly? It's worth asking the question, is there a healthier way to reminisce rather than forking over money to the newest futile attempt to relive our favorite films? How better can we deal with the fact that every passing second we stray further and further away from our fond memories? It's been almost 40 years to the day that Steven Spielberg's E.T. the Extraterrestrial answered that question with grace and wisdom. E.T. Home from... In case you've somehow missed the most cherished American family film of all time, allow me to give you a quick recap. E.T. the Extraterrestrial follows a young boy named Elliot and his family. He has an older brother, Michael, a younger sister, Gertie, and a mother named Mary. Recently, their father has abandoned them for a new woman. Without the guidance of his father, Elliot finds himself lost, directionless, and forgotten. This slowly starts to change when he meets E.T., an alien that was also abandoned by his tribe, albeit inadvertently. His spacecraft was forced to take off early because a shadowy government organization closed in on their location. In the first few minutes, we're also introduced to the primary antagonist of the film, known only as Keys. Heading the government operation to locate and study E.T., Keys becomes a force to be reckoned with. He covertly listens to the family's private conversations and just all around is a real creeper. On the lam, E.T. finds Elliot, and the two start to foster a connection. Elliot provides shelter, sustenance, and security to E.T., and E.T. provides an emotional lifeline for Elliot. Eventually, the family realizes that E.T. needs to send a message to his homies. E.T. Phone home. E In their effort to help E.T., the family grows and learns together. Through a few character arcs, the film explores a theme of yearning. Oh, God! <laughs> Elliot. What? Elliot? Elliot? Elliot, our protagonist, is in unspoken turmoil at the outset of the film. He's too young to relate to his brother, Michael. He's too old to relate to his sister, Gertie. And his mother doesn't quite know how to care for him. This scene at the dinner table captures the familial void that Elliot's father left when he abandoned them. Not that we don't believe you, honey. Well, it was real, I swear! Maybe it was an iguana. It was no iguana. Maybe an elf or a leprechaun. It was nothing like that, penis breath! Elliot! <laughs> Sit down. Dad would believe me. Maybe you ought to call your father and tell him about it. I can't. He's in Mexico with Sally. In a word, he's longing for the lost attention he used to receive from his father. Their dad is somewhat of a sore spot for Mary, and she hones in on something very specific that Elliot said. It's Mexico. Damn it, why don't you grow up? Think how other people feel for a change. The man she once loved is changing in a way that's contrary to her memory of him. Mary's sadness is foreign to her children. They are still upholding the idealistic memory of their father that's clouded by the emotions of the time they spent with him. Her grief is a more mature and adult reaction to this news. She understands that the past is in the past and things are changing. In true old school fashion, the absent father motif is explored sparingly through short dialogue scenes. The only other moment Elliot brings his father up occurs when they're looking for tools so that E.T. can contact his people. Michael and Elliot reminisce about good memories with their father. Dad, sure. 
Remember when he used to take us out to the ball games and take us to the movies? We'd have popcorn fights. There's a deliberate choice being made to avoid flashback or other visual technique. The dialogue presents a more objective view of these events for the audience to take in. Instead of over embellishing or perhaps misrepresenting these past events visually, we instead see how these events are affecting the characters in the present moment. Using a flashback here would allow us to revisit those memories when they're best left in the past, or they should be. Michael seems hopeful that eventually their father will return and things will go back to normal. But Elliot responds somewhat unenthusiastically. We'll do that again, Elliot. Sure. He's starting to come to a more adult understanding of his situation. It's unlikely that things will ever return to the way they were, and his idealized time with his father is at an end. Throughout the film, he tries to resist this cruel fact of life through E.T. by feigning ignorance. Earlier in that same scene, Elliot lashes out against Michael for insinuating that E.T. is having some declining health issues. He doesn't look too good anymore. Don't say that! We're fine! Really, Elliot, I think he might be getting kind look, of sick. Look, he's fine, Michael! Okay, okay. I forget I mentioned it. It's pretty apparent that E.T. is in fact getting sicker, probably because he wasn't meant for Earth's biosphere. Later, during E.T.'s attempt to phone home, Elliot again brushes aside reality and pleads with him for a fairy tale ending. You could be happy here. I could take care of you. I wouldn't let anybody hurt you. We could grow up together, E.T. I mean, can you blame him? Elliot finally found someone to fill the void his father left, and now he's grown attached to E.T. Initially, it's a match made in heaven, but it becomes more problematic as the two develop an unspoken connection with each other. Through sci-fi magic, they feel each other's feelings and think each other's thoughts. Just as their connection strengthens, E.T. is now dead set on leaving. The day after, as if to highlight what would happen if Elliot got his way, E.T. is found on the brink of death. They can't just stay together to keep the good times rolling at the expense of E.T.'s health. Around this time, the government led by Keyes swoops in and in typical government fashion, creates a bureaucracy that results in the suffering of the people that need the most help. Ed also delays the plot another 30 minutes. Elliot and E.T., now linked, are set to die together, just feet apart. Elliot pleads with E.T. to stay with him, this time with a different context. E.T., stay with me. Together. Elliot's become so attached to not being lonely that he's fully willing to die with E.T. to stay connected. In this heartbreaking scene, E.T. relinquishes his connection with Elliot and elects to die alone. Creature's pressure is bottoming out. How's the boy? He's converting back to normal sinus rhythm. They're separating. Yes, boy definitely separating. He lets go and moves on for the greater good. It's a powerful lesson for Elliot in how to handle the ending of a cherished memory. From the very moment they touched down, the aliens were being hunted by keys. Sinister music follows him and his cronies basically everywhere they go. Spielberg chooses to obscure keys, showing us only glimpses of his silhouette. Shooting him in this manner gives us the impression that this could really be anyone, and creates this cryptic and imposing presence. Thanks to some interesting shots, from the very get-go we know very little about it. This strange angle accomplishes a few things. First and foremost, the framing shows us his keychain, which hangs from his belt loop. The keys are his calling card, something to recognize the character by when he shows up later. But character introductions can also be used to convey a film's deeper themes. This crotch shot came off comically initially because, well, you're staring at a guy's package, until you dig a bit deeper. We don't see a significant male adult character's face until Keys reveals himself. And that's basically two thirds of the way through the movie. Elliot's school teacher is assumedly male based on his voice, but he's never framed in a way that shows us his face. Spielberg even shot and cut a scene featuring Elliot's principal, a cameo by Harrison Ford. Even here, in an explicit, fun cameo, we never see Harrison Ford's face. This all brings us back to Keyes' character introduction. It sounds funny to say this, but 
the crotch shot is informing us about one of the movie's central themes. There's no steady male adult role model for Elliot to emotionally latch onto. I take his introduction to represent maturity or adulthood. Keys is a dark mirror of what Elliot could potentially grow into should he not grow out of his childhood wistfulness. He's the hero of his own story and an excellent foil for Elliot. Given all the foreboding music and visuals leading up to when he finally shows his face, it's kind of funny when we actually meet Keys and he's just an ordinary, caring guy. You did the best that anybody could do. I'm glad he met you first. Spielberg didn't have to give him motivation much past just being a government agent following orders, but he took great care to flesh Keyes' character out. He came to me. Elliot, he came to me too. I've been wishing for this since I was 10 years old. I don't want him to die. He's ecstatic that E.T. has returned. But his being here is a miracle, Elliot. It's a miracle. His whole life has been consumed by a memory, and his ambition has never strayed away from reclaiming it. What can we do that we're not already doing? He needs to go home. Of course he'd prefer if E.T. survives, but he's unwilling to enact Elliot's solution. He needs to go home. He can't stay forever. As an extension of Keyes' harmful yearning, the government has spent untold amounts of taxpayer dollars trying to keep E.T. here past his time. Where are your taxes going? Think about it. None of the life support works, and even after E.T. dies, they attempt to freeze him in order to preserve him for longer. All of this paints an unwillingness in Keyes to let go of a cherished memory. He's ever-present with his idealized past, and selfishly trying to recapture a moment of fleeting innocence. I don't believe in you in my life. Every day. In an emotional moment, Elliot finally comes to terms with reality. E.T. is gone. Keyes, likely seeing himself in Elliot, allows him to say his final goodbye. I love you. E.T. from home. The moment Elliot proves his acceptance and willingness to let go, E.T. is resurrected, as if to reward him for learning that all good things must come to an end. But there's still a problem. They're stuck inside government surveillance, which provides Elliot with an action-packed chance to refute Keyes' ideology. Together with Michael and Gertie, Elliot hatches an escape plan to free E.T. and get him to his rendezvous point. In one of the most iconic visual allegories of all time, Elliot, Michael, and their band of friends ride like hell on their bikes with E.T. as the authorities make chase in their cars. Bikes are typically symbols of childhood, a means of transportation before you're old enough to drive. Here they're being used by children that are more mature and have a greater willingness to let go than the adults that pursue them. The authorities fail to capture the boys as E.T. uses telekinesis to bring them to the clearing in the woods. It's there that the waterworks can finally fly. Come. Elliot remains steadfast, proving he's learned his lesson. He denies E.T.'s request to continue their journey together. He's not meant to go with E.T. His place is here, and their time is at an end. Out. Ouch. Together they experience sadness and recognition that their relationship is over. And then, in perhaps the most memorable moment in film history, E.T. reassures Elliot that they will always exist in each other's memories. I'll be right here. E.T. walks to his ship and the blast door closes extremely slowly, allowing us to relish in the last moment this duo will ever see each other. Both characters now choosing to allow this experience to slip into memory. If we're to take on the lesson of E.T. the extraterrestrial, then there's an answer to our initial question. How should we reminisce? 
there's nothing to be gained by endlessly acting on our remembrance. Yearning for a better time long past can be dangerous. It may insidiously hinder our efforts to grow as individuals. Though the problem isn't yearning itself, but being consumed by it. Having a strong ambition to bring back the good times long past their shining moments. So rather than reacting to the newest late sequel or reboot with blind rage or giddy hype, look inward. Are we annoyed or excited because we selfishly wish to relive some emotion-entangled memory? Take a moment and grieve your past. Just go rewatch the original, or if you can't, tell someone why you love it. We must cover the time we have with the things we love, because eventually that time will be over. Let those moments be meaningful. Let them define us, even. And then gracefully let those moments slide into memory. Things have their time, and then they end. Jesus! What's up, guys? I really wanted to do a video on E.T. because I'm trying to theme my videos a little bit better and as you know we're nearing up on the 40th anniversary of E.T. So I hope I provided some greater understanding or at least a want in you to watch the film again. This is the first time I've written a video in like about three months so I felt a little bit rusty. Let me know if that came off in the writing. What are your guys' thoughts on E.T. or anything I had to say here? Is my crotch shot interpretation just a little too tinfoil hat for you to go along with? Let me know in the comments section. As I'm sure you know, I'm committed to this YouTube channel. I genuinely enjoy doing this content a lot of the time. So if you enjoy this content, like, comment, and subscribe, but also maybe share it to a friend. The more people that subscribe and watch them, the more motivation I have to produce this content at more regular intervals. If you have a movie that you'd like me to break down, let me know in the comments section and I'd be happy to get to it at some point. And yeah, I think that's all I got, so thanks for watching. See you next time.